Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you all to this Europe, Friends of Europe's Policy Insight on renovating Europe's buildings. Uh, sharing the burden of energy efficiency and carbon savings costs. This, uh, we have a number of uh, contributors for you who are from either for local uh, member state, people who are involved in making sure issues around women's involvement in the movement of renovating our uh, buildings and making sure that they are fit for purpose, including people who are involved in transforming forming them and someone from uh, one of our the ambassadors from the climate pact this event is under the umbrella of the European Climate Pact, and we are a partner to it. And as a result, this conversation happens at a moment in time where we're all thinking about energy and we're thinking about carbon reduction. And we know that climate change and its impact is having a significant, and that's putting it lightly, effect on all our livelihoods. Uh, give, a, give a thought to those whose income is hardly anything at this stage, where they're having to make some very difficult choices that most of us around in this virtual room won't have to consider, not at least for the moment. Um, so th this debate is really very much about understanding what can happen, what can we do, who should take the responsibility uh, in terms of burden sharing around renovating our, our buildings, some facts to frame our conversation. At least 75%, uh, if not more, of our buildings, that's, you know, government buildings, schools, our homes, factories, etc., are all the biggest emitters of carbon. Um, they are consuming uh, significantly, and this will continue. And mostly about 85 to 90% of these buildings will continue to be in place uh, until 2050, well beyond the targets that have been set by governments and others. Whilst we know from the IPCC reports most recently that time is not necessarily on our side. We may have run out of time and we need to do much more, much more to accelerate the pace on carbon reduction. We also know there's a poverty, uh, poverty issue here. Um, in 2019, this is 2019, so this is like two, two, two three years ago, uh, 80 million uh, citizens in Europe were unable to or were late on paying the utility bills. Now think now that just in this short space of six months after the onset of the Ukraine war and what we've ha what's happened regarding Russian ace, uh, oil and gas, what will that be? That number will have doubled, I would imagine, uh, if not more. So there's a kind of a poverty trap issue in this consideration. And that's why it's really important that we have a conversation about what do we do to accelerate the pace of renovation? How do we make sure that citizens don't lose out and also ensure that we have a pathway that's very clearly delineated in terms of what government does, what um, civil society does and what the private sector does as we think about building and thinking about the fact that we need to be thinking about a different social contract for Europe. Energy and buildings renovations is key to that in terms of people's livelihoods and our objectives to reduce carbon. So these are kind of some of the discussions we'll be having in this next hour with you. And as I said, we've got a number of contributors to help us along the way. What I'd like you to do and make sure that this happens, please, is to make sure your, your webcam or your, you know, your, your image is there uh, rather than off. Um, keep yourselves muted. And then if you want to raise a question, indicate to me in the usual way. Use your virtual hand and that's located at the participants icon. If you press on that, you'll find the icon. Just raise that and that'll indicate to me that you want to come in and you want to engage in the conversation. Uh, I'd also urge all of you to use a Zoom chat. We find that actually those of you who have come up with a thought or a resource you want to share, post it on there or if there's a question let people react to it as well we use that intelligence to be able to then create a report that reflects some of the issues the resources ideas and recommendations you come up with in this time together so without further ado let me kick off with our first contributor i'm very pleased to welcome robert he's the envoy for sustainable buildings at the dutch ministry uh, of the interior and so um Robert, thank you for joining us. It's really good to have you here. Give us your take on this conundrum of collaboration. We know there's an EU-wide necessity. Uh, there is also something at a national level and, and national collaborations, but critically at city, local level, we need to make sure we make this issue urgent, but able to develop it in a way that makes sense. So, you know, in terms of uh, what is the most sustainable pathway for sustainable buildings and the building stock that we have? Can we do it? 
given what we know what the numbers are that I quoted. So where do you, and where do you see the responsibilities lying uh, uh, in terms of action, but also further policy development? Over to you, Robert. Okay, well, thank you, thank you for having me as well. And um, first of all, I think that, well, you, you, you asked the question, can we do it? And I think, well, basically the answer to that question is, uh, that is not a question, we have to do it. So that, that's, that's the debate, not anymore. So, so there is no debate anymore on the why we should do this. We, we actually know that we should do it. So the urgency is very clear to all, the ambitions are clear as well. So we know that we have to take, uh, to 55% to emissions reduction by 2030 and then uh, climate neutrality by 2050. That's clear to all, either if you're in government or a citizen or, or uh, in, in the private sector. The good thing I think right now is that um, we all know uh, what the ambitions are. However, uh, the road towards achieving those goals, that's still where the discussion lies and where the debate is going on. And, and that leads to many people being uncertain to what to do and, and even avoiding to, to start take action. And well, actually I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago and somebody said, well, if you wait for the best color TV, then you end up uh, looking black and white for the rest of your life. Mm. Um, and, and that's what we are discussing now. So we have to take action and we have to take action now. And that's also why our minister will launch a policy next week, actually. So even before all the negotiations about new policy measures uh, within the European Union have been finalized, we'll start to take action now and, and we will focus there on free action lines, which are for the Dutch government, but also for everybody actually. So, and then the free action lines are, first of all, provide clarity. What we have learned by speaking with citizens, by speaking with homeowners, by speaking with the private sector, is that they tell us, please be clear about what to do. Uh, set clear norms, set clear requirements, um, uh, what to do, to do and what we need to do uh, in order to be uh, future proof, to be um, uh, clear on well, what is the road towards uh, meeting the requirements as well. And you can set the bar really high. We don't really care as long as the bar is really clear. And that's what we're going to do. So what we're going to do is set high ambitious bars and then tell people, okay, this is where we have to jump. So that's the first one. That's the role of government as well, to be very clear on what to do and then how, aim, how high we have to aim. The second is that we all have to commit on affordability. So we, we know, as, as you mentioned yourself as well, that um, uh, we have to make sure that the sustainable home is in reach for everybody. Uh, and we know from research in the Netherlands that more than 80% of the Dutch citizens, so Dutch homeowners, are actually able to, to uh, fund uh, the, the renovation of their home, but most times they're not willing to. They want to reserve that money to uh, get another bathroom or kitchen and, and not invest in uh, renovating for less energy consumption. And that has to change. But, uh, but of course, well, if there's more than 80% of homeowners who are able to pay, then still you have 20% who don't have the ability to pay for it. And that's where we should focus our policies on. And that's where we should also look at, okay, how we can provide financial incentives, such subsidies, but also other kinds of taxation, et cetera, to support them to also be able to catch up and make sure that a sustainable home is within reach for them as well. And then the first one, and I'll, I'll end up after that, is that we'll have to provide for adequate knowledge and capacity uh, for homeowners. So we have to unburden them. We have to support municipalities to take action but also to support the market. But we all know that already uh, there's a very big shortage of, of capacity within the building sector. Uh, in the Netherlands, we also have a very high, high housing demand. So we have to actually build more homes, but at the same time, we have to renovate about 8 million homes. So we need uh, more capacity, we need more knowledge, but also we need to industrialize renovation. So to work together to bundle demand in order to be able to standardize, to industrialize, because we also know that, well, if you want to double the renovation rates of, of, of homes, and we actually do need to double the renovation rate, even maybe triple it, then we cannot come up with the solutions we were used to. So uh, we need to work together with the private sector, with society to say, okay, how are we going to bundle demand? How are we going to standardize, industrialize in order to get things done? So 
and that's a shared responsibility to all, I think. So that's what I would like to start off with. Thank you. The question that occurs to me is, in your discussion, so let's take you at a, a national level, in terms of the private sector, you're saying let's like, you know, create AAA rating, like that are, you know, future proofed, for example, there's a cost to that, right? So there's two ways of cutting it, you either create a kind of a, a tax levy approach, um, and, you know, we find a windfall tax to be able to fund this, or the private sector is going to have to invest more, or with government subsidies, um, or simply they're going to have to invest. But the only way they will do that if there's a public duty on them to renovate buildings, at the moment there isn't such a duty. So in terms of your conversation with the private sector, um, what kind of reaction have you got uh, from builders and others to this conundrum? Do they want more money? Uh, they may want clarity, mm -hmm. but who's going to fund the bill? Well, we as a society have to pay the, pay the bill, of course. So, so we all, and, and of course, and, and that's that's that might be a, a nice game to play. On okay, how can I avoid paying the bill, paying the bill, but and let it end up at somebody else's place? But uh, I think, and or we think that um, the time for for those kinds of games is over. So uh, the the uh, the crisis is this high that. We have to really work together. So, and that's what when we're talking with the private sector, for instance, and we just say, okay, well, uh, things like gas-fired heating uh, systems. Well, we have to uh, eradicate them. So we have to switch uh, at least to hybrid heating systems, but uh, preferably to uh, other kinds of all-electric systems, for instance. And when you are very clear to the private sector that you say, okay, well, these kinds of, of uh, installations we'll have to get rid of them, then they, they say, okay, well, if you're this clear about that, then we're going to act upon it. Um, and that's what, what the clarity okay, is Okay, let me press upon you a little bit more. We're going you know, to, to, okay, fine. Of course, society needs to pay, but that's not clear about who, 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 who actually pays for this. Is it citizens through more tax? Um, or, or is it because you're going to legislate for this? At the moment, there is no legislation in the private sector to do some of these things. So you're looking at member states, perhaps, potentially introducing legislation that, uh, let's say, eradicates, um, let's say, 20th, uh, 20th, 20th century infrastructure uh, for gas boilers, etc. I mean, you know, tell me what your view is, at, you know, from your perspective, you're in the Netherlands, what kind of approach are you taking to paying this, or are you going to create a legislation? We do both. So we, we do subsidize, we do uh, incentivize, we do uh, both towards the private sector. We, we subsidize them to innovate. And at the same time, we subsidize uh, people buying the things uh, in order to, uh, to buy the right stuff. Uh, but um, of course, we do need uh, to have uh, the income as a government in order to pay for all these subsidies. And that, that's where taxation comes from. And, um, and then you, are, you can ask the question, okay, and how are we going to tax and who are we going to tax? Uh, and there's plenty of different uh, avenues to, to walk on that. And uh, so, yes, you can do it simply through VAT, but that's of course not the solution. So that's also what we're looking into. And that's also what Europe is looking into through the, the energy taxation directive to, to change the way we tax things. So for instance, to um, raise the bar on fossil fuels uh, when it comes to taxation and lower it on electricity uh, and things like that. So taxation is not a simple thing as well. We do need taxes to get the income in order to redistribute this wealth to subsidies and stuff like that. But uh, how we are going to collect that money is also uh, an issue in itself. Further, but I'd really welcome views from our virtual audience because you know it's the million dollar question who pays for it and how do we pay for it and there are many ways there are many you know uh, uh, tricks instruments that could be created but ultimately uh, someone has to pay for it and we know that oil and gas companies have got a windfall at the moment given our geopolitical and security situation they're they're earning mega millions uh, at the moment and so what's the trade-off here in terms of where we've just come from through two a continuing crisis on health and e economics. People's livelihoods have gone downwards in terms of material value. And we know at the moment that the cost of energy is sub sub significantly reducing their spending capacity at one level. And so there has to be a different kind of deal, surely, 
on how we make uh, buildings sustainable, reduce carbon, and engage citizens in a way that doesn't actually turn them off the idea of sustainability and, and tackling and taking uh, green action and, and feeling part of the solution, but but not being penalised for it. So on that, so what I'd welcome is if you've any of you got views, I mean, who should pay for this? If you've got a view that it's government subsidy, or is it taxation on citizens, or is it a mix? Give a view uh, on on these uh, notions about who pays, who should pay for this transition in terms of building innovation, and is it is tax the route we take? So uh, I really welcome your views. Don't hesitate to put on the on the Zoom chat. On the point of cost, let me move to and citizens. Let me move to Anna. Anna, you're a European Climate uh, Pact ambassador in Poland. And just a little bit of information uh, to share, again, to frame your contribution. I understand that, you know, there were peer parliaments established uh, uh, between um, November 21 and March of this year, where about 461 small groups came together to discuss this particular issue um, and think about what are the most um, effective ways in which citizens could be helped. And I quote, the most preferred option to use energy more efficiently, sustainably in the home was incentives for switching to renewable at home and cheaper energy saving technologies for low income households. And then also when the question was about what can you do in terms of responsibility and behaviour, there was a clear sense that government needs to lead on this and it can't just be about consumers leading behaviour. But the recommended policy action, and I quote, was to adapt working hours and building act architecture design to natural cycles and family needs and dialogue with local st stakeholders, citizens in the development of fair transition plans. So, Anna, um, you, you are one of these ambassadors. What's your view on um, what policymakers should do that ensures that this cost, this responsibility doesn't simply fall on citizens or rather they do not have to have a disproportionate uh, effect on their livelihoods for managing this problem, which is, as uh, as the previous speaker said, it's a whole society issue. Over to you, Anna. Yeah, it's a very hard question because normally I'm from Poland, so here we have a lot of houses with uh, living in a poor society, and even they don't have money for a normal life. And then how they should uh, think about uh, energy saving or making over their home. So the, the most important thing is how to reduce or give the money properly to, to those uh, people. Yeah, firstly, can be, of course, uh, treated by uh, dotation from government. And we have such uh, opportunity in Poland that we get money to... Uh, to make over our house and be more sustainable. So it's possible, but still it takes about 30% uh, percent of, <clears throat> of the amount. Uh, so can be also a big amount for household. And uh, the, the next question, it should be considered uh, from the taxes. Uh, but still, I think in Poland we have huge problem with that because um, we have huge inflation. But I think, like mostly in over the world, and we struggle with COVID. And now we have the the, the war and uh, in our neighbors. So everything is very um, hard. And important is to look for different kind of fundings can be from taxes from the government and maybe uh, some solution from the private sector which help the, the poorest people to um, to to help them uh, to reduce to redistribute the buildings the materials and maybe some uh, some more things we try to do it but it's very hard one uh, and how I said before, uh, we're looking for low production because we don't have it. We don't have uh, officer from the government and the state uh, government. So we still find uh, finding some solution. Uh, we try to help our government, state government, to uh, reduce uh, this problem. But 
I think um, we don't have time. So first of all, yeah, but uh, we should find the right uh, lower regulation. And we don't have it still in Poland, especially. Unfortunately, your um, your connection is really poor. So we I didn't know. capture everything that you had mentioned. But I think we get the we get the nub of it. You know, Poland, like other places uh, across Europe, we know we have the highest inflationary rises uh, in fifty years. You know, it, it's it's phenomenal what's happened on the back of the Ukraine war, and so. Inflation is rampant in a way that no one ever projected or thought that would happen, actually. Uh, there was a view that it would be OK. And we also know that interest rates will gradually also follow suit. And all of that's going to have an impact on, you know, uh, weekly, monthly pay packets of people across the board. And, and also will in, invariably increase the welfare bill where it exists for national government. So it's not an easy one. It isn't an easy one, but you're right. There, are, there should be ways in which you create a distributive model uh, so that the, the sh it doesn't actually fall on the shoulders of citizens. But thank you for joining us. Uh, again, I encourage those of you yeah, who are here exactly. uh, plugged in, do share your views. Uh, raise your hands if you want to make a comment and respond and react to what you've heard so far. What I'm going to do now is going to, I'm going to bring in one of our uh, citizens from our Debating Europe platform. So as I've mentioned before, we have a Debating Europe platform that has over 6 million citizens that engage in issues of uh, policy and politics that matter to them. And we pose questions to them and they pose questions back. And so we're really pleased that we have uh, one such uh, question, which will be on video in a moment from Milan from Slovakia. So I'm just gonna wait for that to be teed up so we're able to show it. It should be on your screens in a, in a few seconds. If or when are we going to see some real political will and determination and also financial support to transfer from gas to more renewable energy sources. Now I'm talking specifically about former East Bloc countries and their households, which are even today heavily gas dependent. And this is a question to all the speakers, but it could be to all of you. But... And he's saying, um, if or when are we going to see more political will to transfer from gas to more renewable sources. Talking specifically about former East Bloc countries and their households, which are even today heavily gas dependent. We also know about 40% of households in Europe continue to use Russian gas. Um, and you know that, well, despite our plans, that's the reality of it. Gas boilers are in the main in most households across Europe. So what, you know, what could be done I mean, what will politicians do specifically, and especially looking at the Eastern Bloc countries? So um, are there any speakers who are prepared to take a, a punt at that? Raise your hands, although I pick on you. Ah, Robert, thank you for coming back. Well, of course, I'm, I'm not from an Eastern European country, okay? But, but still, uh, at the same time, in the Netherlands, we, um, we used to have a very big gas bubble under our country. So in the 1960s, it was obliged to uh, hook up every household uh, with a, a gas fire heating system or gas piping. And so even now, uh, nowadays, 90% of all our homes are linked up to a gas system and have their own gas fired boiler system. So um, the, problem, the problems are similar to us as, as they are in Eastern Europe. And for us, um, our ministers or we as a government say, okay, well, we have to get rid of those. So by 2050, all these gas fired heating systems have, have to be uh, gone. Um, and that's once more so to provide that clarity. So yes, you now have this boiler system, uh, but it won't be there uh, in, in 10, 20, uh, ultimately 30 years time. So you have to take action and we have to take action together. So we, if you know that if your gas boiler system breaks down, then you have to be very clear that uh, you cannot uh, buy another one and, and just install that one, but you have to look for alternatives. So that's what we provide. Um, and, um, and of course, we subsidize alternatives and we're also, also looking into, okay, what kind of alternatives are there? And that can differ per district actually. So in one district where the, the homes are really new, then you can go to an all electric solution and in others where there are very old monumental houses, then 
you'll need something different, like a, a district heating system, for instance. And that's what we are then going to, to install there. But of course, that'll take time. So that's what we are talking with, uh, with our citizens. So that's, I think, the way forward. It's, it's not just as a government paying for all the, the alternative systems, but working together with the citizens and, and the private sector and say, okay, well, what are the alternatives and where should we install what kind of alternatives? And getting that out there. In the Netherlands, we have, a, and then I'll stop, we have a, an initiative uh, called uh, Natural Gas Free Districts, where we are uh, going one district at a time to remove the gas systems and install different systems. And that will be, well, we currently have 64 districts where we are rolling this out. And the solutions are in every diff district are different, but the prime objective there is to work with the local citizenship to, to discuss with them, okay, the gas fire systems are, will be gone, but what is the alternative? And we have to tackle that together and then discuss that one house at a time. So that's the way we do it at, at least. Some people, I mean, that's admirable and it sounds like a really exciting initiative. I hope you can share information on that because it sounds like the, the kind of proper citizen engagement, bottom up approach to this agenda. So do share the initiative. But some might argue that, you know, it's really cost costly to do that. But actually, I imagine that the cost will outweigh the benefit because you'll have people on, you know, engaged and moving in that direction and coming up with a, a solution. And it's again, uh, friends of Europe, one of the things we want to develop is uh, the notion of a renewed social contract and what you've just described actually is in practice what a new social contract would do is to speak to people about this problem and actually between the three pillars citizen private sector government coming up with a solution that that sticks so thank you for sharing that uh really really pleased that you be able to bring that and it's a it's a it's a inspiring uh, idea, in fact, if people can pull it off. So thank you for sharing that. Katharina, uh, you also have your hand up. Please do um, introduce yourself. Would you, I'm going to pull you in later. You're one of our speakers. But in response to this question, I'd really welcome your views. But do introduce yourself. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So nice to, to see you here. And thanks for the invitation. So I'm Katharina. I'm working for Women Engage for Common Future. It's an international NGO working a lot on the energy transition uh, with um, focus on social and gender justice. I'm also engaged in Germany in the citizen energy sector uh, in our umbrella association. I wanted to react regarding the political will because I think that's a very crucial and serious question. So I mm. agree with all uh, Robert mentioned uh, before, but I think the point is, so we have, so we have we need the, the political will and the courage to change our energy system because we still we are in our old centralized energy system with new technologies and so I think we we, we need more much more ambition so to to um, to cope with the transition and one example is in Germany so. For example, we have absolute green light at the moment for four very big LNG terminals. So that's mm. a lot of money. It's a high speed. And if we would have the, the same speed and the same money for the renewables, for energy mm. efficiency, I think we would have a really a future oriented and sustainable solution. And I think so exactly. here we see a lot of possibilities and opportunities, but still stick to the old system. And that's a big problem. Thank you. Thank you for raising. And you make that really important point. You know, politicians are making decisions which are about the here and now. But actually, you know, on this agenda, the data, we're living the data. Look at the temperatures that we're living through at the moment. We are in the data set. We don't need a report. We can see how the weather changes on a day to day basis. We're seeing what's happening. So the data is real time and politicians are making decisions to LNG terminals. Well, actually, that, 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 that investment could be actually made here and now to accelerate alternatives. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Benjamin, uh, I believe you are online too. From the Oco Institute, and I'm I here. You yes. <laughs> Hello. Thank there. you for being here. Please do say say what what's on your mind. Um, yeah, sure. Do introduce, introduce yourself. Yes. Introduce yourself, please. <laughs> I'm uh, Benjamin, um, working at the Oco Institute uh, in the um, sector of energy and climate uh, protection, focusing on the so-called heat transition and energy efficiency. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, the political will, that, that was actually a, a good point. Um, currently, I have the feeling that we have a very, very difficult um, 
political landscape, I would say, in, in Germany. Um, so mm -hmm. there is a commitment from all parties in charge to climate change mitigation and the Paris Agreement. But uh, I think there is no consensus uh, on the, the pathway towards that. Um, so um, there are currently many, many uh, policies uh, under revision uh, in Germany. And uh, there were quite a few good solutions um, discussed, uh, but uh, they're, I think they will not come into force uh, very soon, like uh, focus on renewables and in new buildings, which is actually from a technical point of view, very easy. Um, so there is no ban of fossil fuels yet. Uh, I hope it will be soon. Um, but on the other hand, there are some initiatives, uh, I think, which are really good. Uh, so. Um, Germany introduced the CO2 price in the building sector uh, just uh, last year. And finally, um, there is uh, a split of the, the burden um, on the way and uh, hopefully will pass uh, parliament uh, before the summer break. Uh, so uh, the, the costs of the CO2 price are split between tenants and landlords. Um, based on the energy consumption of a specific building. Uh, so in, in poor, poorly renovated buildings, uh, the, the landlords have to pay more. Uh, in highly efficient buildings, uh, the tenants have to pay more. So this yeah. is, I think, uh, one, one way uh, and a good way. But uh, so far, looking at the energy prices, uh, definitely not enough. And uh, how we can cope with that uh, is still an open question. And uh, yeah, so far, uh, I think I, I make a point here. Um, mm -hmm. What would you yes. like from, because, you know, there's great hope in, installed in the, in the new uh, coalition government in terms of what would you like from Germany, but also uh, share with us, what would you like from the EU? What would you like them to do differently now? So both from your government at local level and also from the EU. Um. From the EU, I think uh, in, in the German context, it's always good when we have a clear vision from the EU side, and um, because then it's easier to really uh, bring through policies uh, through Parliament uh, in Germany. Uh, so there is a lot of hope uh, concerning the EPBD. Uh, if this is very strict, uh, it's easier for us here in Germany to really, um, yeah, design ambitious uh, policies, ambitious laws. Um, that's that's a crucial point, definitely. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, much appreciated. So you know, some sort of, some sort of like kind of more assertive leadership um, at the EU level that might drive action at a member state level was a consistent theme of this conversation. Okay, I'm going to move on to uh, our, our next group of speakers. So, uh, Katrina, warm welcome to you. You've already contributed, but uh, bring you in now. Um, you're you know, a board member, uh, leader of the Sustainable Energy and Climate Solutions at the Women Engage for a Common Future. Uh, really pleased to have you with us. Um, what's, you know, from your perspective, what's the role of community-led energy initiatives in the context we find ourselves um, and, you know, about making sure our buildings can be saved or made, made more resilient into the future. So what is the role of community-led energy, uh, energy efficiency pro programs? Yeah, okay, thank you for this important question. So, so I agree, so for example, to achieve our targets in terms of uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency, we need massive investments. So in decentralized energy resources and energy efficiency savings, all kinds of smart energy solutions that allow to use the energy and our energy infrastructure as efficiently as possible. And of course, it's a financial challenge what we have to do. And that's also a question of today, but it's also an organizational challenge what we have to face here. And it requires from our perspective an active participation of the end users and citizens as key actors. So, and energy communities and community-led initiatives, for example, they can make here an enormous contribution 
uh, in this regard. And we know that, for example, about 2 million of people in the EU they are already involved in more than uh, 7,700 energy communities. And the engagement is increasing and attracting more attention. So this bottom-up development. Mm -hmm. the re renewable energy communities, so they have been defined in the Renewable Energy Directive 2019. And uh, so they are legal entities based on open and voluntary participation and effectively controlled by their shareholders, which are citizens, which are SMEs, so social and medium-sized enterprises, local authorities, and any kind of initiatives and associations striving for the energy transition. And the purpose is to provide environmental, economic, and social community benefits for the members in their area. So, and so we have seen in many countries, like in Germany, in Denmark, in Belgium, also France, very positive development of energy communities. And they can engage in many different activities of like in collective self-consumption schemes and energy sharing, which is also agreed in the Renewable Energy Direct and we hope also in Germany it will be implemented soon uh, and optimize the use of renewables, reducing grid congestion, so implementing energy efficiency measures, energy savings uh, concepts, etc. And this prosumer concept, so meaning citizens consume mm. energy, they are informed, they are interested producers of energy, they have a deeper understanding about energy supply and consumption, they more about technical terms like how much kilowatt hours do they need for the households, for example, they have more ideas, they have more motivation, and they have they take more time and uh, more interest and, and money to to invest in energy efficiency measures and energy saving um, concepts for example and we need for this uh, challenge so we need different kind of knowledge or, and actors of course legal technological financial and it's very important to include the beneficiaries, so the people living in the buildings at eye level. And energy communities here, for example, they could act like on a, on a meso level, so combining and bringing together the different stakeholders and technology. So for example, the private sector and the macro level, so all the target was we have, what we have, um, and including the needs and interests uh, and resources of the beneficiary, beneficiary. so for example, the, the, ma the macro level. I think we, you mentioned, so we have to talk to the private sector, we have the policy, we have all the experts, and we have to bring it together. And we think that energy communities with the experience, with the legal framework and the backing of the Renewable Energy Directive, for example, they have high expertise, they have experience in the sector, and they can combine renewable mm -hmm. energy production uh, combined with roof renovations, for example, insulation, and that could also, for example, reduce complexity. And uh, here we see a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. putting in place the uh, renewable energy directives and also to see the potential of um, energy communities. And that's my last point here. So that's the experience in Germany, what we have that energy communities and also citizen energies, it has been marginalized. So it's nice people, politicians, they like it, but it's not taken as a big solution. And I compared again with the LNG terminals. So mm. we did a study in Germany, uh, we published two weeks ago, and we showed that energy communities with energy sharing, so with producing and trading energy via the public grid, they could contribute to 35% to the renewable energy goals in Germany, including energy efficiency measures, so a super high potential. No, sure. I mean, just a, a month or so ago, we had a, we had a conversation um, where we we realised that you know uh, if you know consumer behaviour could have a huge percentage you know impact on carbon reduction, uh, but also save money. So, but in it, but from what you're saying, and this is kind of if you could explain a little bit more. What I've taken from what you said is it's more about the behavior set, being able to first information, uh, being much much more aware about you know what's at stake. Uh, what you can do and understand the kind of accountabilities here but there's also about energy community saving you know saving with each other finding alternative sources installing other technical uh, uh devices etc but it's very much on the consumption side what's happening in terms of ownership so is there a way in which it's not simply about energy communities having to fend for themselves and find solutions but are there any which are about having a stake in the production of energy and therefore community ownership of 
energy. Are there any such models happening that you're aware of? Well, there are many models. So just to distinguish, the first one is um, to produce energy. So the energy yeah. community, so the main target at the moment, and so it's produce renewable energy. So in, in Germany, the, um, the share of citizen energy is pretty high. It's about including, of course, the farmers. It's about 40%. So it's a, a high uh, uh, potential to produce renewable energy and so to, to involve the people, to engage them, to use the, um, the investments of the citizens, for example, that's also very important. And that's one point. Second point is regarding the decentralized energy transition. So to produce the energy at the place. Oh, we lost uh, you there. The, the grid con, con, uh, grid um, expansion that's also and the third one it's of course it's the ownership and so for example energy communities they are democratic and trustful corporations and we also see that uh, it's super important for long-term energy efficiency measures of 20 and 30 years so sometimes you you need a long-term it's a long-term investment sure. and, and to do it in energy communities for example where you anyhow have trustful uh, cooperation that we see in condominiums, in residential buildings, for example, also organized as cooperatives. Um, so we see um, great concepts and models uh, where energy efficiency measures are implemented. So it's a combination uh, to have for the, for the whole energy transition. So to not to, to see only the production, it's super important energy efficiency and energy saving, but so really so the energy literacy, which is yeah. done to use yeah. it and to use the full power of that and to show this big potential. So Catherine, what you're saying is there is an element in this kind of, if we call it a whole economy, whole society approach to uh, energy, that in a part of that cycle, there is ownership of the production of energy as well by these energy communities. Is that right? Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I think that, that's the point that uh, is, um, the common, the joint ownership of energy production and so also to be members of these communities and, for example, yeah. to be benefited if you are in such a community and, for example, if you have this behavior to, to relieve the grid, etc. And so to, to, have, to, to have the full usage of, the, of local energy market, for example. So there is, um, and th there is, uh, yeah, there are these big advantages. And maybe just to add, because we talk about, um, so Robert mentioned, so we are clear about the targets. I, I think we are not clear about the speed. <laughs> so I think you yeah. talked about uh, 45 or uh, 2050, for example, here, here we talk about a lot about 2030. So really to speed up. And so we need the full power of the society. So everything, but, and so I would like also to mention that we need also a socially just energy transition. So what you have mentioned, so that the mm. burden is, uh, taken over by in a, in a just way and also energy communities for example they allow people facing um, or suffering on energy poverty so they might have the opportunity for example to become a member of an energy community and to produce their own energy on the roof which is much cheaper than the energy of the grid and it would be m m more cheaper if we would have a just energy market which to which reflects the real uh, costs of renewables and which reflects the real costs of the fossils for example and so here mm. this is a potential of energy sharing which is mm. in, in the renewable energy directive which for, for example al already is in place in austria in italy in luxembourg and we hope in germany we have our easter package and summer package of, of our government and we really hope for energy sharing in the summer package Catherine, that's very bold. I like the notion of a just energy market. Wow, can you imagine? Have you done some work on this? Have you written it up what a just energy market might look like? Yeah, well, it's, uh, of course, it, uh, it's access to, to energy. Uh, for... No, sure. Sorry, I mean, I'm, I'm, you don't have to explain it because I think, you know, people may get the It's a case whether you've actually got something written that can be shared because it's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's a good idea. It's a yeah, good yeah, idea yeah. Uh, to, for people to see. What, is, what does a just energy market look like? And you make the point really well about timing because, you know, it feels to me when you read the most recent IPCC report, 2030 is not even really the target anymore. And actually, we're going to have to recalibrate our timescale significantly, especially when you think every year we get to this point and we hear it's the hottest ever. And we've seen some really the, te the, te the tectonic plates under our Earth or within ours are shifting 
really significantly. And we're only in May. Uh, you know, temperatures at 40, uh, 45, some parts of Spain, um, you know, Belgium last week and this week has had 31, 32, 33. It's unheard of. So, you know, and that's just that spread across the piece. So the timing, I think, is, is a really important one. Briefly, can I ask you just to say to, in, in very short terms, you're speaking to a policymaker. What are the equality and social justice issues that a policymaker needs to take account of when they're thinking about this whole issue? Well, we have to think about when we talk about uh, funding programs for energy, for LNG terminals, for electromobility. So just to think who are the beneficiaries of the program? So we know, uh, for example, one example is on e electromobility. We have we had a nice program in Corona times so, so, so to push electromobility and we saw that 80 percent of men, for example, they are benefiting out of because they have uh, more expensive cars, they drive more, but it's OK. But just to see who are the beneficiaries fisheries whom I want to, to have the, the benefits, the yields, the results, the positive outcome of it. And is it, do I want to have a, a, a fair society or do I want to have multinationals <laughs> earning a lot of money, for example? I think that is very important and that should be considered in the targets. And the second point is so to leave the silos in the governments and also on EU level. So, and to bring together uh, climate and energy policy, gender justice, social policy, for example, I think that's super important also to have a coherent policy for um, socially just uh, accelerated energy transition. I know it's very abstract, but there are concepts around. So we did mm -hmm. an analysis of the European Green Deal, for example, I can share the link. And yeah. we also worked out some recommendations. Catherine, it's a lovely dream. And I, I, and I don't mean to uh, diminish it by calling it a dream because so we know. It's a reality, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, I know. It, no, I hope it is a reality in terms of what you set out. It'd be good to know who's doing that. Who is making sure there's an inclusive, just energy framework? As a watchdog um, of the can... civil societies like us, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm talking about a whole society, whole economy, because <laughs> you know you're not a politician. You're not making the decisions on national budgets. You're not the tax raiser uh, or, or the intervener. So that is a huge part of it. And there's an open question here, isn't there? Is that, you know, back in the day, um, a lot of energy companies were nationalised. Are we looking at that potential uh, when you think about how unfettered unfettered the the profiteering there's been at the moment of uh, oil and, and gas companies who've had the biggest biggest payout uh, at the moment and you know something has to give surely we're at that time that's why i say i don't mean to diminish it. i think it's great what you're saying and let's hope many others in your energy communities raise the bar and don't forget there's a you know european election coming up on 2023 so let's see how much of because i imagine energy will be a driver of those ballot votes at some point in the next 24 months. So thank you very much. I'm going to, I've got a question from uh, Carlos, but I'm going to um, move firstly on to our next speaker. And that is Dennis. Dennis, you're from uh, at MetaBuild. And, you know, I'm, you know, you can provide us with a sense of what are the technologies that are currently present that might help us transform our building stock? Uh, it's a big question and we're all looking forward to hearing because actually um, what you have to say matters, not to put too much responsibility on your shoulders, but you know, that is the thing. What are the technologies? Is it hard? What, what do you know, are they available readily? And is it a question of political will to actually adapt them and engage them and make sure they work? Over to you, Dennis. Well, thank you very much. I'm Dennis. I'm heading the business development section for MetaBuild. And I believe there is one very clear answer to this question, because in our, from our point of view, I believe that um, there's one and single most crucial technological issue here that we're facing is uh, data uh, regarding the building stock. And um, I mean, what portfolio holders need now is an enabling technology. I would say namely data analytics and artificial intelligence that um, elevates uh, the ele availability and also the quality of uh, data regarding the building stock. And I believe the most important factors and parameters around data we're looking at here are basically uh, three points to be made technological wise. And this is the first thing I believe uh, sounds a little funny maybe is like the energy demand is in demand here because 
You know, at the moment, um, the market is basically contemplating um, the energy consumption of buildings largely and mostly. Mm -hmm. And what is much more important than that, from a te technological perspective, to make to be able yeah, to make informed and strategically wise decisions about uh, any renovating strategy, is the energy demand of buildings because it provides comparability and consistency. It, if you will, provide certain standards to interpret on um, within portfolios. Consumption does not. You know, this is the first thing. The second thing is, uh, where do I begin in my portfolio? I mean, like from from a practice practical standpoint, we're working with very big portfolio holders, investors, uh, housing companies in in Germany and Europe. I mean, the big question comes up: which which buildings in my portfolio provide for the highest return on invest? You know, in economic and uh, ecological terms. And um, if you start without a sort of data analytical certainty here. Uh, like the way it uh, happens in current project affairs, uh, what's going to happen is you will end up in hot water quite certainly, you know, um, and this goes simply because with statistical certainty, you will simply start at the wrong end of your portfolio with some active measures, you know, so this is second point, and uh, I believe if you handle the energy demand side, and if you know where to start in your portfolio, and then there comes the big third question, which is like to identify uh, the technically and economically optimal renovation measures, because this is largely unknown. But oh. in average size projects, um, you usually have a certain complexity barrier from beginning of the very early planning stages, because you usually from a from a standard average size project, you have more renovation variants possible or planable, if you will then there are stars flying through our galaxy. Many, many more to say that. And now with the best classical planning team on Earth that you hopefully have for whatever um, endeavor you're on embarking, uh, you may be lucky if three of those trillions and over trillions of variants are even being examined. You know, uh, with the classic class within the classical planning processes. So, so these uh, three steps need to be taken before you even start planning any project. Call it any renovation project. You know, and uh, here comes the Pareto principle into play because, um, uh, as Pareto states, it's in this case about eighty to ninety percent of of all the sustainability, and all the comfort and all the cost parameters in any given renovation project are being uh, they are being tied firmly. Yeah quite firmly, uh, very early in the planning processes, uh, be it new construction, be it renovation. And you, you, you may not wish to, um, to miss addressing these three points, like to basically know the energy demand of your portfolio of each and every single object within it, and to know where to begin in your portfolio regarding the return on invest sure. economically and ecologically, and to identify the, the uh, technically economically optimal renovation measures. So um, I believe this is the most important thing to come up with and over the whole course of any portfolio renovation strategy, building stock renovation strategy. And um, if you miss on those, you will simply stay on the road that, that led the building stock to be uh, what it is today. And it's, today it is the biggest single carbon and Indeed. efficiency so issue. Dennis, so Dennis, um, so that wasn't as hopeful as I thought it might be in terms of solutions, because, but it's, it's very sensible, it's very wise, actually know what you're doing mm -hmm. and not what you know what you're dealing with and then identify what's the best targeted solution where you have highest uh, impact uh, on this agenda. I get all of that, but what concerns me is about the technologies argument. And you said there are as many, it's so complex. Surely in the world we live in, right? Um, people have come together and found a way of renovating, which let's say if we take kind of different scales, you've got apartments, you've got factories, you've got schools, as, as an example, and government buildings. OK, there must be a way where uh, the, the bright minds that are in Europe and elsewhere have thought, actually, if I want to renovate this effectively, this is what I need to do. Here's the blueprint for it. Those exist or not? Well, there is no standardized blueprint. There is a blueprint for each and every specific location. And you need to basically uh, pick it from trillions of possibilities. And this is uh, the way to do it is artificial intelligence and data analytics. And both exist. Both are there. And yeah, I believe it's high time to uh, employ them on a large scale uh, in order to be become 
basically to get the um, possibility to grasp it in order to to reach any of those climate goals politics is talking about yeah sure and so in terms of the kind of work you do have you tested out using ai to be able to identify kind of uh, manageable solutions that are uh, you know uh, both economic uh, uh, and provide the payback Exactly what we're doing. Well, we're basically providers of a respective system, and we have over 100 projects that, uh, yeah, well, we did with very renowned partners and clients from mm -hmm. both investor side and both um, housing company side, for example, and the technology exists, it's there, and it's coming, and I believe it's high time from a political uh, point of view to uh, basically uh, grab a hold of it because it's uh, it may not be well known enough at the moment so funny political positions uh, uh, decisions are being made or being contemplated upon and i believe it's high time to wake up in this regard indeed and what are you doing to make sure you're alerting politicians to this reality are you do you see that as not your role and actually it's somebody else's role that uh, but how do we bring what you've just said uh, uh, to the ears of, you know, people like Timmermans and others, Breton and uh, uh, that, that actually think there's an opportunity here that can be seized, uh, which brings the private civil uh, uh, sectors together, local government, national government, in a, in a, you know, in a really effective combination that could scale up and accelerate this agenda. Yeah, well, I believe there is a clear answer to that. And uh, my feeling, my gut tell me at the moment that um, it uh, this comes by walking down the road we are walking down right now. And this is like basically growing together organically with uh, very well-known investors and housing companies. And um, they will have a, they will, they will suck in, I believe, uh, a whole wave of uh, companies that want to do it like them after they go forward with this good example. And this is exactly the stage we're in right now. And I believe in one year from now, we should be in a different game in terms of uh, the political uh, reception of this, you know, and uh, the yeah, reception needs to happen. And now. is it scalable, um, uh, Dennis? Because we had a question, a written question from one of the uh, one of the participants who's unfortunately left, but Carlos, he'd spoken about, you know, the issue around small apartments and refitting of, you know, uh, pump boilers and, you know, ref actually getting in new systems. And mm -hmm. like, how, you know, is it more difficult to do it in a small apartment versus in a large building? Does it matter, does size matter in this regard? Not really. The size doesn't matter at all. Uh, from a technological standpoint, it's, uh, it doesn't make a difference really if you have a single housing unit or if you have a tower with 200,000 square meters. It's actually, actually technologically wise, absolutely no difference. Great, Dennis. Thank you very much. Um, very right. helpful. Thank you. I'm now going to, again, try to bring in one of our uh, citizen contributors from, our, as I said previously, our Debating Europe platform that engages with over six million citizens across Europe on issues that matter to them, and they post them directly to policymakers. And that's why today, uh, again, uh, we have a citizen, uh, Marie, uh, who is going to ask a question uh, very shortly. And if it doesn't work, I'll read it out. But I'm hoping that we can now uh, bring the video to you, uh, to all of you to be able to listen and watch. Um, and I have two questions related to innovation. First one, how can the EU bring together as a two twin transition, digital and green transition within the digitalization of energy? And the second question would be, we know there is already a lot of innovation taking place at member states level. How can we scale them up at EU level as quickly as possible? Thank you, Marie, for a very excellent question from our Debating Europe Citizens platform. And you know that, that very important question about uh, combining the digital and green transitions, uh, but how do you scale it up from a local to uh, national and you know across Europe. So, uh, if if I may, I'm going to ask uh, Robert uh, to come in on this one um, because of what you do. You're the envoy. In in response to Marie, what would you say to her two questions? Oops. Um, well, it, it starts first of all with with getting the the people nationally on board, and but we already exchange a lot uh, between member states. Uh, so we as governments do that. Uh, I was actually in Athens last week uh, discussing the, the implementation of the EPPD, so the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, 
with all our other member states. So we were there together with some 110 uh, people uh, discussing, okay, what are the best practices and the worst practices around there? And what can we learn from one another? So that is already taking place and we can learn from that. And what we also continuously do is to, to, to collect best practices in member states and, and distribute them uh, among one another. So for instance, taking back to the, uh, the thing Dennis mentioned, um, uh, we in the Netherlands have, for instance, a sectoral approach on for, for utilitarian real estate. Uh, we say, okay, when we're starting to renovate schools, for instance, then we sit together with uh, all the people who are managing schools and say, okay, well, this is one portfolio and how are we going to renovate this portfolio to become climate neutral? Uh, and that is different when it comes, when, when you're talking about schools, then that's a different ball game uh, compared to hospitals or police stations, etc. Et so in the Netherlands, we have 15 of these avenues where we sit together with the people involved and say, okay, let's sit together with the, the school boards, let's sit together with the hospitals, with the care uh, people, etc. The monuments is another uh, avenue. Um, and that's right now we do that on a national level, but we all, are already linking that, that up with uh, people internationally to say, okay, well, this is what we have learned in our experience when we're going to renovate uh, primary schools, for instance, and what can we learn from other countries? So, that, that, but you have to start bottom up. Uh, okay. Another thing, maybe now I'm, you have given me the word to what Katarina mentioned on, on um, uh, engaging communities. Well, that's another thing we, have, we are doing in the Netherlands where we say, okay, if you want to build a wind turbine, we as a government should not decide where to build it because then uh, you attract all kinds of NIMBY uh, sure. responses. Indeed. So what we do these days is that we say, okay, we have to organize a local community and, and you, we have to incentivize them that the local community uh, actually owns about 50% of uh, the local wind turbines or solar fields uh, in order to get them on board. And that's another thing that we are distributing uh, across uh, the EU that we say, okay, well, if you have large local ownership, uh, then you get less uh, not in my backyard kind of behavior. And that's what we see all over the place. So th this is taking place, but it is about exchanging information on there's, you cannot really solve that by, by uh, only setting new norms and standards and stuff. It's, it's also about behavior. And that behavior is, is more or less the same in each member state, I think. Robert, I can see why you're the special envoy. That approach is just so insightful and inspiring. Uh, and it's, it's people-centered, it's community-centered, it's really refreshing to hear that. And I hope there are others like you in across member states can, that can take that uh, approach, which is you know, very focused on how you work with a grain of community, uh, understanding what the impl implications and impact might be if you don't take people with you, but also, I suppose, democratizing to a certain extent that sense of responsibility for who does what. And it's not just saying it's citizens, but actually governments need to reach in and reach out to communities as a key player and not just wait for elections to come around. So thank you very much for that. Katerina, can I ask you to respond to the question from, from your perspective in terms of the digital twin, uh, digital and uh, green transition and how, you know, how do we, you know, you, you work uh, uh, across the piece. Um, how do you scale some of this up through your energy communities? Is there a role here that, you know, all of you come together and create a community of scale uh, to influence policy and action? Mm, well, I think so, uh, first of all, regarding digitalization, I think the important point is also trust. So because we see, for example, what do we like? So we have some resistance, for example, with digitalization, but we also see that we use, for example, a lot of social media because we see a lot of advantage for, for ourselves. So I think so it's very important so to, to have here trustful corporations. That's one argument pro communities, for example. From the technical point of view, so uh, talking about local energy markets. Uh, so we need some digital tools. So we need uh, more data. So I agree with Dennis. So we, 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 we need the, the consumption side. So we have some forecast, but we really need so how much energy is, is needed, is used. How is the forecast, for example? And here we, we will have some support of digital tools, which needs to be applied in a um, confidential way. And I think that's also can be included in energy communities. Um, and yeah, and here I see um, 
uh, yeah. So regarding the questions of the, uh, the twin of digitalization and energy transition, so there are, I think there is a lot of light <laughs> we should use um, and uh, which will be also implemented in local energy markets and also driven by energy communities. Yeah, and it seems to me just from this conversation that actually you and Dennis ought to have a conversation because I can see the power of the fact that what he's suggesting as the use of, I would call it safe, digital, i.e. AI uh, um, and, you know, technology that creates the data, because ultimately we need to understand what's happening and data is key to that. And it seems that, you know, the data sets he's building and has access to uh, and that, that, that capability, wouldn't that make a powerful association with something that you're doing? But, you know, I leave that conversation for both of you to have, because it seems obvious to me, at least, that you've got the perfect combination to really ratchet up the uh, the know-how of technology in the private sector with a clear uh, community-centered approach for changing um, energy markets, but also energy behaviors uh, and what politicians do into the future. As I wrap up this debate, I want to go to just offer Anna. Anna, if there's anything you want to comment on, because you've been very patient listening and watching. I know your connection is very bad, but just I want to make sure that you I give you the chance to come in if you do. And then I'm going to finish off with Dennis. Anna? Yeah, 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 I'm here. I'm here. My, yeah, my connection is very cool one and stable. And yeah, I, I agree with Robert and Katerina. Uh, we need more digitalization. We need more database because we don't have database. We don't know how uh, domestic home, uh, domestic uh, use energy when they using more and less. Uh, so. Yeah, oh, it's a huge problem uh, that we don't have this database, especially in uh, in uh, academic. Also, we don't have such information. Also, we don't can go to to, to citizen and show them the database and show them how they could uh, react on the changes and how they can use this energy properly. So yeah, it's a huge problem. Also, in, uh, I told the same in Poland, West countries. Uh, we are still very old houses and uh, mostly in big uh, cities we have a lot of block of flats so they still are not uh, in good condition uh, also with energy so yeah it's a huge problem Sure, but it's not one that's new. I remember that, you know, um, three years ago, just over three years ago, we brought out a publication um, and we worked with key contributors from Visegrad countries east of Europe to think about the transition and what you could do to incentivize investments so that we could bring the east, if you like, um, that was very much fossil reliant into a new dimension. So I recommend that uh, um, that that publication to all of you because uh, it was fairly far sighted. But the the recommendation was really simple. But as ever, like we've seen with the Gazprom decision, um, our politicians don't take wise action until the time is up or we live in adversity, which is a real pity. Dennis, I want to end with you, if I may, um, because, you know, you've been um, really uh, useful as, with, as the other speakers. But, you know, what you represent is new age technology that could actually accelerate our understanding and boost action on this agenda because it is what we're living with at the moment. Technology is moving at a pace and it's outstripping our ability to catch up with it, catch up with it. From your perspective, it occurs to me that the European Climate Pact need, should have a very clear digital strand using your you know, information data as we move forward. But what would you like to see happen? You know, you, you know there's, you have other peers in Europe, uh, such as MetaBuild. Uh, do you speak to each other? Is there a community there that could really scale up some of this thinking? Well, I believe um, in a sense, yes. Well, we actually, there is no company like us, just frankly okay. speaking, but um, there Good are- Good to know, so therefore that makes it more important that the Climate Pact engage you, because what you're saying is very sensible, but go yes, on, go back to your answering question. 
we think it's a good idea, but there is a, a strong sense of cooperatism, you know, and uh, technical uh, performance providers, they need to, uh, they need to like, basically team up and uh, Metabolt isn't the answer to everything, but we are the answer to data related questions. And I sure. believe this is the beginning of everything. So uh, everything should begin with data, but then there is a strong cooperative sense and more and more te technological performers are growing together here organically, also together with big clients. And I believe that this is the way this is the road to keep walking down, you know, mm -hmm. and um, to make uh, progress possible from a te technical standpoint. No. Great, Dennis. Thank you very much. Thanks to all our contributors. And I kind of just, this is like, you know, top of my head and you may not want to do this and it's not prearranged, but it occurs to me in the one of the things that we need to do is knowledge share and share experience if we're going to create communities uh, that will activate more on this agenda and take action, but feel they know what should be happening in a way that they trust. It occurs to me some of the examples of what you're doing in the Netherlands, Robert, around, you know, these spaces that you're taking, you know, stage by stage would be a good example for other governments. Um, uh, Katrina, your example of community energy uh, uh, com you know, movements and actually looking at the production side, if you could write that up, that would be really interesting. Anna, your, ex your example of, you know, what's it like to live in a context where you're not seeing the shift of burden and responsibility moving in the right direction, but you know that actually where you are, you can see the, the degradation, not only of your income, but also the climate in a local area and actually actions required urgently. And Dennis, finally, finally you could be put together a paper uh, that we would also, for all of these, we'd be happy to publish them. But for you to think about setting out the way you did the three points that what uh, the government and, the, and more importantly, at the European Commission needs to rethink about the use of smart technology, but more importantly, critically, data to drive our intelligent decision making. Um, so on that note, thank you all very much. It's been a very effective and interactive conversation. It's been with lots of good ideas. Let's just hope people listen and, you know, don't wait before it's too late. Um, thank you all for tuning in. It's really good to see you all. Keep an eye on our website. And those of you are interested, we have a Climate and Energy Summit happening in June. Go to our website and you can uh, see when it's happening and, and you can find out more details. We're also having a space summit in June also, which you may be interested in. It's absolutely interlinked with this agenda in terms of understanding what's happening on planet Earth in real time. So thank you all very much. Uh, it's good to see you all and look forward to re-engaging you in the future. Mind your distance, keep safe and see you again very soon. Bye bye. <laughs>